Well, hello, stranger. Welcome back to my channel. Or if you're new here, welcome to my channel. My name is Zach. I am the Swiftologist. And on this YouTube channel, we talk about thoughtful pop culture. And today I'm back in my wheelhouse. I'm doing my regular thing, which is talking about Taylor Swift. Now, before we get into this video, which is going to be me ranking all of the songs from Folklore and Evermore, and then combining them together into one kind of like mastermind album called Folk Evermore, I want to do a little bit of housekeeping and let you know something. I have joined TikTok. And I feel very humbled coming before you and telling you that I've joined TikTok and asking you to follow me. But you know what? Like we're trying to blow up the Swiftologist in 2023. And unfortunately, TikTok is where all the people are. So I'm really going to be using it as like a funnel to my YouTube channel. But I have had fun creating some content for that today. I'm not going to be like using it and interacting with it as like a consumer because I really do think it rots your brain. But I would like you to consider, you know, if you're already rotting your brain on that platform, come and follow me at The Swiftologist. And I think that you'll have fun. If you like this content at all, it will be appealing to you. And we have a Patreon coming in February. Truly, I'm committing to a deadline now. We have it planned out for the evolution of a snake and Swiftologist, and it's going to be awesome. So very excited for this year. Happy New Year to all of you. I hope that you had a wonderful holiday season. It's nice to be getting back into like, you know, the regular, regular, boring vibe of things because the holidays can be a little bit too much. So Today, I'm going to be revisiting these two excellent, excellent pandemic albums full of just like spotless, wonderful songwriting, but also some really slow, boring, lazy moments. And remember, keep it cute in the comments. We'd love to have analytical, thoughtful discussions around here. I feel like I'm getting good at like filtering people out of this channel because it seems like I'm getting less of the crazy comments, but you know, I've just joined TikTok, so I'm going to have to deal with it there. But here we are going to be going through all of these songs, and these are the categories that I have. Of course, we have Iconic, Never Been Done Before, So Gorgeous. Gorgeous, can't say anything to her face. Great gown, beautiful gown. On my list, which is not good. When you get into the yellow, you're not on good terms with me. And green for Be Gone Harlot. That is for the songs that I wish weren't even in the Folk Evermore universe to begin with. And I want to also preface this by saying that my combined track list of Folk Evermore only has like 16 songs. So some of your faves are going to be left off. Some of my faves were kind of left off because you know I like to be doing these track lists in like a thematic, telling a story, having a flow kind of way. So I will also leave that playlist of how I've set up these two combined albums together, Folk Evermore, linked in the description. So Follow my Spotify account if you want, because I'm going to be putting all my like reshuffled track list playlists there. Midnight's is already up, Lover, and maybe Reputation. So this template that I found doesn't have the bonus tracks, I don't think. The Lakes, It's Time to Go, and Right Where You Left Me. It's Time to Go uh, is gone, okay? She's gone. I never listened to her. I don't even care enough about her to put her like in Be Gone Harlot or on my list. So there are kind of two like free tiles, and the free tiles I'm going to use for those bonus songs. So Right Where You Left Me, Where Does She Go? Straight into Iconic, Never fucking been done before because she hasn't who's doing it like right where you left me truly and I think that you guys will really appreciate where I put right where you left me on the revised track list that I've created but right where you left me is just it really it's so feral to me and if we're talking about midnight's songs right where you left me really is that desperate plea in the middle of the night that frozen uh in the moment I feel like I'm wondering if she was kind of getting into red taylor's version when she wrote this because to me this is such a red song I can really picture like the visual for me is taylor in the begin again music video in the cafe in Paris, just kind of frozen in that position. Um, 23 Insider Fantasy, we know. And also, we are all girls who lives in delusion. Who amongst us is not living in delusion? So right where you left me, iconic, never been done before. The Lakes. I really stand and rode hard for The Lakes when it first came out, but I just don't return to it all that much. I don't know why. There is that line about like tweeting a rose, and I don't love that, but it doesn't ruin the song to such a degree for me. So I'm probably just gonna put her in great gown, beautiful gown, because like I do like her and when I listen to her, I'm very appreciative of her. But at the end of the day, is she a superstar? She's not. The One. This is another song that I had like a complete and total moment with. And I think that Folklore for me, like it was such a pandemic album and that it came out like right when shit was really hitting the fan. And so when I do listen to it again, certain songs I really associate with like isolation time. And some of that time was good and creative and some of that time was really not good. So occasionally a few of these songs conjure a memory that is not amazing for me, but the one is, kind of like on the borderline of like a good and a bad memory song. I love this though, because again, it's a Hailer song. I'm not a Hailer. People stop accusing me of being a Hailer. I'm not a Hailer. I just know a Hailer song when I hear one and I tend to like those songs. I 
don't care about the boring man, Harry Styles. He's really not in my wheelhouse. I feel like you have to like both of the people involved in a ship to be a true shipper. And like, I don't. I just love Taylor. So the one, where am I going to put it? So gorgeous. Can't say anything to her face. Cardigan. Now I'm about to rile the girls up. I'm about to make some of you real mad at me. I don't think that Cardigan is that good. I certainly don't really understand why it was like the chosen one from folklore to like lead us into this era. I suppose like it does have a nice marketing tie in with those stupid cardigans that she made. And I do love the video. Like I love the video. The song itself though, it just is a little incoherent to me. It's the first verse is not good enough to draw you in. However, when we get into that back half of the song, I knew you lingered like a tattooed kiss. I mean, that is ingrained and etched in my memory. So because of that, I'm going to put her in so gorgeous, but I don't know if she's going to stay there forever. Up next is The Last Great American Dynasty. Now, again, do I listen to the song all the time? Not really. But is this one of Taylor Swift's best songwriting moments of all time? Absolutely. This is so clever. It really kind of harkened back to the country songwriting tradition that we really hadn't seen in such a long time by the time that folklore rolled around again. Um, this was also pre all of the Taylor's version stuff, right? So we hadn't done a lot of like revisiting into the past and like reappraising all of the, you know, skills from Taylor that we've known and loved over the years. And The Last Great American Dynasty is such a, like Betty, it has that like country songwriting tradition, but it's so clever and it has that blank space quality to it as well, where she's addressing like her public perception or she's, tying herself into this fictional narrative and I think that it's like the best bridge between like the old Taylor the purely diaristic and autobiographical Taylor and this new Taylor that we were being introduced to this this girl who was you know getting lost in delusions and taking a walk into the woods of folklore and making shit up so Last Great American Dynasty is iconic and it has never been done before truly so there she goes Exile Great gown, beautiful gown. I had my moment with it, but like, I don't know. It's just a little bit too slow. Is it a little bit forced? Maybe, but I really do like the duet and the trading off. And I think that her and Bonnie Bear sound wonderful together. I prefer the other Bonnie Bear collaboration, but you know what? Exile is a cute girl. She has a great gown. She has a beautiful gown on. My Tears Ricochet, straight into iconic, never been done before. I mean, this song just gives me a lot of pain. It, it makes me suffer. And that's what a track five is supposed to do. My Tears Ricochet, as many of you already know, is the track five on Folklore. The emotional moment, the kind of uh, emotive turning point of the record. I really love this song. It's about the master situation for sure to me. And I think that, you know, Taylor hasn't really addressed that directly in songs since. And I think that this is the closest we're going to get to like a direct vulnerable moment. And I think you can watch one of my Folklore Evermore revisited videos to see my kind of in-depth thoughts on why I think My Tears Ricochet is such a stunning moment for her songwriting, but it is. And so she's going into Iconic. Illicit Affairs. I'm going to put her in So Gorgeous. And Illicit Affairs was like my number one song when I first heard it. Like I was in tears when I first heard this song. I was crying. I was so ready to put her at the top of my list in, in my rankings. And it's just... I don't know, fallen out of favor with me over the time. I'm very fickle, as I'm sure you've realized. My rankings change day to day. But I will say that my Evermore and Folklore preferences, once they kind of settled in, have really stuck. So Illicit Affairs is great. I love it. I think that the bridge is so beautiful. Some really good songwriting there. And also, you know, like Taylor has not historically been super sympathetic to people who cheat on other people. Um, and perhaps, you know, when she did it herself, she had a turning around moment. And I think that this was like a very empathetic song and I could really see herself putting herself in someone else's shoes, seeing through someone else's perspective, which is what the whole Folk Evermore thing was about. And Taylor often gets accused of being like narcissistic and too focused on the minutia of her own life. And I love that this was kind of a subtle fuck you to all the haters who said that because I think that she can insert herself into other people's shoes. Do I think she should be doing that from any sort of political perspective? No. But do I think that she should be doing it from like a fictional storytelling vibe? Absolutely. Because that's what made these two records so strong. Invisible String. Iconic. Never been done before. I love Invisible String. Invisible String has grown on me so much since the album came out. I feel like this happens to me a lot when I'm doing reactions. The back half of an album kind of washes over me because I'm so shook and shaken by whatever the front half of the album has been like loaded with. So Invisible String kind of slipped me by a little bit. I did love the lyrics about like, you know, I send my ex-boyfriend's baby's presents. I thought that was so cute. It really is like a full circle moment. And I think it reflects those like very kind of 
moments of clarity that we had in the pandemic that we all had these like realizations that we were having it seems that that moment of introspection and having like uh some sort of bird's eye view on your life because we're all forcibly stopped to like take stock of everything that seems to be out of trend out of focus now but I loved what it did for us in that moment and Invisible String I think is a really good example of that. Mad Woman, um, great gown, beautiful gown. And I think I'm being a little generous here. So Mad Woman is kind of like vigilante shit in that it's more interesting for like the actual tea that it reveals to us rather than it being a great song on its own. I will say that hearing Taylor Swift say fuck you forever for the first time, that was a moment. It was a moment that was most pleasing to me in my career. But do I come back to Mad Woman? I don't. Hardly ever. I just don't really care to listen to it. Although Folklore is one of the only Taylor Swift albums that you can put on start to finish, no pacing interruptions, pretty much goes with the flow, almost no skips, evermore, cannot say the same. Love her, high highs, but low lows. Uh, Folklore is definitely more consistent overall in quality and in vibes. So I will give Mad Woman the props where it's due, but I just don't think that it's excellent. Epiphany? I know everyone thinks that I hate this song. I don't really hate it. It's just like, like I will listen to it occasionally, but it's just so long and involved. It's like such a commitment to hear this song and I don't want to work hard to enjoy my music. You know, I want it to wash over me. I want to be lost in a daydream. I do not want to have to be like listening to these clunky lyrics. I think she tried to shoehorn a bunch of different metaphors into this and it didn't really work for me, but I love when she tries something new and this is definitely like the most experimental song on the record. So I can appreciate it for what it is. Betty. Now, do I want to put her in iconic? Iconic, I have to be more uh, mercurial with what I'm putting in that tier because it's got to be like the best of the best. Betty is going to go in so gorgeous. I, I, again, had my moment with Betty. I, the James Inez Betty triangle didn't really sink in with me that much. I know everybody was freaking out about it and like the Blake Lively element to it all and August, we're going to get into that. But I just think that Betty is probably of the three songs cardigan betty in august i would say betty is the best i also love the little turn at the end i listen don't get me wrong i had my moment with this song i love the performance that she did of it i thought her voice sounded really good i love that there was a country twang like that flavor coming back this and the last great american dynasty have that narrative kind of like flip it on its head at the end of the song kind of thing also writing from a male perspective that is interesting but is it my favorite is it iconic has it never been done before no not in my opinion peace Peace is going in great gown. And you know, back when I first listened to Folklore, I would have put that and Hoax both in Be Gone or at least in On My List. But they have each kind of grown on me over time or I've sat with them. Peace is a very interesting song. It really does talk about Taylor's kind of like turbulent, melancholic uh, inner world and how she feels as though she can barely protect herself from the kind of um, vicious changes in her inner emotional landscape, let alone like protect someone else from the side effects of being around someone that has that. Um, and there was a lot of like kind of thinly veiled discussions of mental health on this record. And that really gets at something that I think we haven't heard from Taylor before, maybe a little bit in Afterglow on Lover. Actually, that's probably the sister song to piece thematically. But yeah, I think that it's very interesting and revealing. And that that is what's really interesting about Folklore and Evermore. She's so smart. She said her craziest shit. She gave us her most inner, um, like deep revealing thoughts. And she disguised it as fiction so that nobody could hold it over her head. And that was genius. Who, could, who can begrudge a genius? Not me. A mastermind, shall we say? Hoax. I'm going to put hoax in on my list. And I kind of feel bad putting her there because I do... No, I don't like hoax. I'm not going to lie. Madeline, the co-host of The Evolution of a Snake, the podcast that I uh, produce, write, co-host, edit with my friend Madeline about Taylor Swift's entire career. She loves hoax so much. And her point about it is that it's like a, it's like a horcrux. You don't really know like what it means or what it's supposed to be about. When you listen to it, it just has these kind of like unyielding possibilities about what it could be. I don't like that so much. I don't love when Taylor is super ambiguous. I like a little room for interpretation, but I like to be like shepherded in a direction. You know, I like to know where I'm going. Like, what, am I going left? Am I going right? With hoax, I just never really know what I'm listening to, even though it is kind of interesting. And I love that line, you know, stood on the cliffside screaming, give me a reason. That's a beautiful moment. It's very like uh, Wuthering Heights almost. I really do get kind of like a forlorn English literature kind of essence to it. But that doesn't make it my favorite song. Mirrorball, iconic, 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 iconic. Where else am I going to put Mirrorball? That is 
other than Peace, the most revealing song on the record, really kind of addresses Taylor's like endless pursuit of applause and her desperate need to be liked and to be understood and to set the record straight and to perform and to dazzle people. Because at the end of the day, she really wants you to clap for her. She really is doing this high wire balancing act where she's, you know, walking on a really thin line at a really high height, looking down at all these people that fucking hate her, waiting for her to trip over and fall. And I love that line, I've never been a natural, all I do is try and try and try. And that is so true about Taylor because the criticism that she always gets in terms of her like performances on stage and her like reactions to winning awards is that she's very wooden and that she's very stiff and everything comes across as very rehearsed. Why? Because it doesn't come naturally to her. She has to practice and work hard at these things. And to me, that is something to respect and admire, not something to tear down or be angry about. So. I love that introspective moment. I would have loved to have seen more of those kinds of revelations on Midnight's, but we won't be getting into that in this video. Seven, another iconic show-stopping, never been done before a song. I love this song. So when we talk about ambiguity and like leaving room for interpretation, Seven is a much better example of that than Hoax, in my opinion. Seven has this like beautiful, wonderful, hot, hazy, tropical vibe. It really reminds me of growing up in Singapore. I grew up like close to the equator in the tropics where I live now. And I, you know, really just have this vision of myself as a child when I hear this song. And there are definitely queer elements, gay undertones to this song. I do not speculate about Taylor Swift's sexuality on this channel and neither do you in the comments because I will delete them. But I'm just saying that there is an element in this song, I think from childhood, that is very relatable to anybody that grew up maybe not had a sexual so love to hear that august great gown beautiful gown and you're lucky that i didn't put her down further yes you are i am not a big fan of august i just think that it's like extraordinarily overhyped it has a fun bridge that's about it it's a bit of a snooze fest to me i do like the opening line salt air and the rust on your door it has a vibe to it but again i think i've said this in a couple of videos there there are some songs that are for simple people and august is a song for simple people so if you're simple you would definitely put august in iconic if you're not simple you wouldn't be putting it there so Congrats to all the simple people. Enjoy your life. This is me trying. Um, so gorgeous. That song has grown on me over time. I liked it a lot. I think this and Illicit Affair actually were my like top two songs from Folklore when I first heard the record. But as I've grown into them, this is me trying fell off hard for me. And then when the Long Pond Studio Sessions came out, I was like, wait, this kind of slaps. And I love the discussion that she had with Jack Antonoff in that like recording that they did. Again, I do think this addresses mental health issues, which really is probably the main theme and undercurrent of Folklore now that I'm thinking about it. Uh, but I like that it is similar to Illicit Affairs and that I can really see Taylor like trying to put herself in someone else's shoes. And we just love to see an empath at work, don't we babes? Up next, we're getting into ever more Ivy, iconic, iconic. Ivy did something to me, like it cracked me in a very specific way. I don't know how to describe it, but this is truly one of her prettiest songs. Like it's an extremely intricate, beautiful, layered. It has a very deliberate and skilled vocal delivery. And I love the production work on this. I believe it was Aaron and Jack that produced this, right? So it was just like the greatest minds all together coming to create something that is so luscious and beautiful and ornate. It I don't know how to describe Ivy. It has a very beautiful storytelling as well. Again, and vague with a little bit of room for interpretation but also it's clear that this is truly a fictional song but I think that Taylor was in her bag when she wrote this and there isn't an, another song in her discography like Ivy I'm very drawn to the folksiness of it as well this is probably the closest to a folk song she gets from Folk Evermore uh, as I've said multiple times the, these are pop albums they are not genre shifts but this is really getting at something interesting and speaking of getting at things that are really interesting Cowboy Like Me iconic never been done before so the ever more fictional element I think is much more fictional than what we got on Folklore. Folklore is like there are a couple of fictional setups but there are many layered like personal confessions kind of peppered throughout. She said that Evermore was kind of a run-on continuation of this project so I think that she got more comfortable writing from that fictional POV as she was going through and that explains why we have such a diverse range of scenarios, voices, and settings on Evermore and Cowboy Like Me is like truly stunning. It is a stunning stunning song it just has such a vibe and an atmosphere and a totally unique uh, world making within it a lot of the evermore songs are their own little worlds inside of each other which is why the album isn't as cohesive as something like folklore but the highs the standouts from this album are so beautiful and wonderful and i think that cowboy like me deserves all of the flowers that it never gets uh, other than from masterminds like me 
Uh, Willow. I'm going to put her in great gown, beautiful gown. I just don't think that Willow was that good. I think that it was... It reminds me of Cardigan and that it was kind of like a forced lead single moment, uh, but I do think the Cardigan is more successful than Willow. The video is cute, I suppose. I liked the invisible string running all the way through. Comes back stronger than a 90s trend. Can't. It kills it for me. It takes me out of this timeless, elegant, classic construction that we've made with Folklore and Evermore. You could dip in and out of those. They're not going to date, but this line in the song dates it, and it also just has no context to the lyrics that it's appearing within. So I don't love that. Champagne Problems. I'm very tempted to put it in on my list, but I can admit that it's not a bad song. So I'll put it in Great Gown, Beautiful Gown. Actually, no, this is my subjective ranking. I'll put it where the fuck I want to put it. Champagne Problems goes in on my list because it's on my list. I don't listen to it. I don't like it. It's not that good. I think that it's like very, it's, it's very, it's full of pathos. It's like oversimplified emotion. The only like great moment in this is she's fucked in the head and you guys just like it because it's swearing. The story is not that interesting to me. I don't really know what she's talking about. I am not interested. I mean, I do know what she's talking about because it's very simple. Sorry, let me clarify. This is another song that is for simple people. This and August are for those amongst us who need to be told how to feel. We can't take our own things away from songs. We need to be instructed. That's you. I just think the Champagne Problems is kind of a snooze. It's a little boring. I think that it's certainly not a songwriting highlight from this record, but a lot of people would be scared to hear that. A lot of people would be scared to hear that Cowboy Like Me is in fact written better than Champagne Problems. More intricate, more complex, introduces more interesting themes. I mean, you know, not everybody would get it, but that's why I have this channel to make other people get it. Gold Rush, iconic, never been done before. Listen, Gold Rush is the closest that we got to a banger. And I remember when I was listening to Evermore for the first time, I was like, I just want a beat. After Champagne Problems, I was like, please give me a fucking beat. And what did I get? I got a beat. And this beautiful, interesting, swelling orchestral arrangement that dips in and dips out and kind of doesn't really take off in any particular way. But I love the kind of tunnel vision that she has on this song. The the fading into the gray of her day old tea, that, that daydreaming, that kind of getting lost in a maladaptive daydream where you can like see your whole life with somebody that you've just met pan out right in front of you. That is a very Swiftian theme element metaphor and I love how it sounds too like it's it's very rich and ornate and lush like Ivy it has that very beautiful unique arrangement to it tis the damn season listen look how many iconic songs there are from these two albums they can't it can't be denied why should I deny credit to greatness where it is due tis the damn season is my favorite spiritual sister to Christmas is when you were mine one of her early Christmas songs and I know that there are some of you that think that this is not well produced or that this isn't well mixed you're wrong you're wrong this song does have a kind of like a DIY feel to it but I think that it sounds so raw and so real and I love the guitar I love how there's like a little scratch and some reverb to it I am completely obsessed with the songwriting on this this is what Champagne Problems thinks that it is or this is what you guys think Champagne's Problems is I am obsessed with Tis the Damn Season I love the bridge so much this just takes me to a place and it's a place that I've never been it's a place that I've never like experienced but I feel as though I have been there before and that is the trick of really great fictional songwriting tolerate it oh my god pain 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 I every day I suffer every day we stray further from God's light tolerate it oh my god oh my god that it shouldn't even be a track five because like a track five I don't think is supposed to like completely gut you in that way it's not supposed to like really make you feel as though you are a piece of garbage you are the gum on the sole of someone's shoe I feel some type of way about this song and in 2021 2021 was not a good year for me and what was my top listen song of the whole year tolerate it that's how you know that's how you know that the mental state is not doing well when tolerated is being played over and over and over again but this song is so interesting it's written in five four time fifth fourth i don't i'm not a musician i don't know how to say it but it has an interesting rhythm beat also melody to it and I just think that her vocal is so gorgeous here and she's describing such a simple yet profoundly wounding feeling which is to be overlooked by someone you know, I think that there are certainly real life situations and relationships that inspire the events that are you know written diaristically and fictionally in this song but I truly do think that it is beautiful I wonder if she was watching Mad Men around this because it has Betty Draper vibes like this song really does have a Betty Draper energy to it no body no crime it's a nothing song. It's a nothing song. It's on my list because it, it gave nothing. Like it gave, I'm trying to do a country song and I would like to let Haim sing on it. And that's all. That's all. I have literally nothing else to say about it. Happiness on my list. 
Happiness is boring. I know that a lot of people like it, and there are some interesting lines and thoughts and moments in it, but the actual song itself, the way that it sounds, the way that it progresses to me, the middle part of Evermore really drags, which is why like geniuses like me need to come in and redo the track list. I think maybe I would have liked it more had it not come up in that moment on the album, but it's just too, it's too slow for me. It's too much. I'm not interested. Dorothea, be gone, wench, get out of my face, get out of my life. I never want to hear you again. Ear blood to me. I will not go on another. I hate Dorothea tirade, but just know that she sucks. Okay. I hate these, this like corny, cheesy shit. I hate it. It sucks. Blech. Don't like it. Goodbye. Coney Island, um, mm, on my list. I feel like on my list is a little bit too strong of a word for the songs that I'm putting here. I think instead of on my list, these are like nothing songs. Like Go Girl, Give Us Nothing. That's what this category should be called because Coney Island, I felt some type of way when I first heard it, but I think that it's trying too hard to be what the Bonnie Iver songs are, you know? She's like forcing a duet, she's forcing an emotional moment, and it just didn't resonate, it didn't land with me. I know a lot of people like it, but it's just not for me. Long story short, Great Gown, Beautiful Gown, that is another song that I like decided I detested when I heard it, but it has grown on me over time. I have been weakened, my walls have been beaten down. I love the past me, I want to tell you not to get caught up in those petty things. We keep in mind before this, we didn't have a lot of self-referential Taylor moments. It was like Invisible String and this song on Folk Evermore were the kind of ones that addressed the experience that she had gone through over the, the cancellation period in a way that felt authentic and emotional, not in like that I'm doing so much better vibe. I forgot that you existed. Garbage. Marjorie. Um, I'm going to put her in Great Gown, Beautiful Gown. It's a meaningful song. It was very emotional. I definitely resonate with the sentiment behind that song, but... I don't listen to it. I don't revisit it very often. So it doesn't really go that far for me. Closure on my list. Although it's okay to me now. Before it was like Dorothea where I like truly, truly couldn't hack it. But now it's just more like, mm, I skip it if it comes on. I don't like the pots and pans, the Charlie XCX life production. It's not for me. But I, I, I kind of, the, the refrain, the melody of, yes, I got your letter. Yes, I'm doing better. I, it gets stuck in my head from time to time. Evermore, iconic, never been done before. Can you believe that this, this list is mostly iconic, never been done before songs? I mean, it just goes to show the power and the strength of the songwriting on these records that I can't even be a hater. Even I, famous hater, cannot hate on the power of these songs. I can't, I won't, I refuse, I shan't. And Evermore truly is a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful bookend. Perfect bookend to this series and this chapter of her discography and her career. It also has such an interesting kind of like fall apart, break down, come back together moment at the end of it. Bonnie Vare, I think, is used sparingly on this song and he adds this rich and luscious element to it. It's beautiful. It's wonderful. All right, now we can get into my reshuffled track list. So we're creating one album here, right? It's Folk Evermore. We are combining the highs and the lows of each of these albums and putting them together. I actually think that I left off one of my favorite songs from this album, and that will show you that I'm dedicated and committed to the bit. And the bit today is that I want to create a cohesive track list that is front to back bangers in an order of cohesion. So because these are fictional songs, it's hard to like create a story or a narrative out of it. So I'm going more for a vibe, but I do think that there is a way to kind of like sequentially arrange these songs so that it tells a story of some description. So I think that we start this album, this Folk Evermore hypothetical album that I'm talking about, we start this in a state of delusion. We love to be in delusion. We are delusional because that's definitely an element of Folk Evermore, right? It's like making shit up in your head, having realizations, being introspective. So we start in delusion and then we kind of get into reflection and breakdown and depression because that's the other part of a pandemic isolation album. And then we circle back around to the kind of like pulling yourself out of the isolation of the pandemic, you know, world getting back to normal. You're kind of putting all of these like unfinished threads that you pulled while you were sitting around doing nothing. You're kind of putting them to rest again. Then we get into the conclusion, the resolution. So we'll start with the living in delusion. So where do we begin? I am not changing the bookends for this era. No, I'm not. I'm starting with the one because I think that the one I'm doing good, I'm on some new shit. That is the perfect line to get into this era, this renegotiation of Taylor Swift's songwriting skills, this appraisal, this return to form. So we're starting with the one also because it has that kind of like dreams and that casual, that kind of shrugged off, but uh, kind of also deeply melancholic 
vibe, we're starting there. And then we're going straight into Gold Rush. We head out of that like woodsy element and we go straight into a beautiful, luscious dining room, right? Where we sit around, everything's gilded and ornate, and we are continually having these delusions, you know, thinking of what could have and should have and would have happened. We started thinking about that in the one, now we're getting into it in Gold Rush. And then in number three, you know, we're really starting to get unhinged. At the end of Gold Rush, we know that it could never be, so we're getting into situations of things that really truly are not gonna work out in our favor, so track three is Ivy. I think that Ivy and Gold Rush have a similar kind of like elaborate production that I think sounds really beautiful when you listen to them sequentially. And track number four is Illicit Affairs, okay? You know, because that builds off of the themes that we're talking about in Ivy. We're talking about desperation. We're talking about wishing that things could be different. We're talking about pursuing people that maybe you shouldn't be pursuing. And then everything hits the fan, shit hits the fan. So the two track fives that we have from Folk Evermore are Tolerate It and My Tears Ricochet. Neither of those are the track five on Folk Evermore. On Folk Evermore, the track five is right where you left me because that is the most track five track five of this era that I can think of. Like it truly just, it ties so many like ends of Taylor's different career and this very kind of like innate fear that she has of being broken, of being jilted, of being left at the altar per se. She's talked about that in many different kinds of iterations. And I think that Right Where You Left Me truly is that moment of being frozen. It is a track five to me spiritually. So I put it in track five. Track six, we are now getting into the depression, right? We're wallowing, okay? We've been stuck, we've been frozen, we've been delusional, and now the reality of it is hitting us. So six, we have Tis the Damn Season, the Christmassy moment, that kind of reflective pause between Christmas and New New year. Do you see what I mean? Are you getting the vibe that I'm trying to create for you here? Track number seven is Tolerate It. Yep, after Tis the Damn Season, we get straight into Tolerate It because you can't believe that you've been in this situation for so long. And up next is Mirrorball 8 because then, you know, we're starting to really reckon and grapple with our role in the misery that we create. You know, sometimes you look around and you're like, hmm, I have to take responsibility for the shit that I've done, for the fires that I've lit. I need to start putting them out and I need to reflect, you know, I need to go through the ruins and see, you know, what burned down? What can I leave there and what do I need to rebuild? And then after Mirrorball at track eight, we go into track nine, which is My Tears Ricochet. And this, I think, is the emotive kind of like uh, feeling the feelings part of the track list. My Tears Ricochet is a wallowing song. It's a, it's a look, you hurt me and I'll never be the same ever again. And I don't know if I can forgive you for what you did. And I just wish that you hadn't done it and we didn't have to go through this together. Because clearly you're hurting and I'm hurting. And can't we just lay our weapons down? You know the answer is no, but you wish that it could be different somehow. Track 10 is This Is Me Trying because we're, you know, we're still wallowing. We're still there. And I think that This Is Me Trying leads kind of nicely into the next part of the track list because This Is Me Trying ultimately is an optimistic song. It's a hopeful song. You're talking about coming out of a period where you were indulging your worst habits, your worst tendencies, but you're really trying not to do it. Even though you might be doing the bare minimum, you might just be getting out of bed every day and, and, and taking a shower and going for a walk, but that's that's everything that you can muster. And that is, you know, an accomplishment in and of itself. So track 10 is This Is Me Trying. Track 11 is Cowboy Like Me, because now we're getting into a more dreamy, a more happy, a more kind of like optimistic, wondering what the future could look like moment and track 12 is seven you know because we have like this ambiguous moment as well we're reflecting but we're not reflecting in a way that is making us feel like bogged down with the past we're reflecting to take stock of the past to inform the future and track 13 is invisible string because you know at the end of the storm there is a rainbow and at the end of the rainbow is a pot of gold and we're slowly but surely making our way towards that pot of gold right we're having an emotional release and experience here and we're getting into like the fun part of the album now because I definitely I definitely do think there are some beautiful moments of levity on Folk Evermore that are equally as profound and moving and meaningful as the like deep, dark, depressive songs. Track number 14 is August. Yes, I kept it on here because it is fun and it is a moment of levity, as I mentioned, that I think that we do need when we're listening to this, this uh, journey of Taylor's that she went on as a fictional songwriter. And track number 15 is Betty, just because, you know, I love Betty being towards the end of a track list and it is like a cutesy storytelling vibe. Like you're in a good mood after you listen to Betty. And then track 16, the final track on Folk Evermore, the moment where we are leaving, you know, we're putting down all of what we went through in this experience and just kind of trying to move on, chart a new path is Evermore. And that's where it ends. So I've cut off a lot of songs. Now I was going to grant myself some bonus songs because Taylor did have bonus songs for each of these albums. So my options for bonus songs here are The Last Great American Dynasty, Peace, Cardigan, and long story short, those are the ones that I think should be bonus songs if we're making the Supremes the greatest hits. So I think as bonus songs, I'm gonna tack on The Last Great American Dynasty and also Peace. 
Yeah, because I think that peace is revealing and it says stuff. Yes, I'm cutting cardigan. I don't want to hear you complain about it. I mean, you can complain about it if you want. Just keep it cute in the comments per usual. So that is my reorganized track list. I will leave a link to the Spotify if you would like to listen to it. I don't know if I'm going to add in the bonus tracks onto that or leave it the way that it is with my fake standard edition, but I think I will. I think I will. We'll see. You can click the link and check out if I ended up doing it or not. But that is all that I have for you today in this video. Next week, we're going to be talking about something not Taylor Swift related. That's your clue for what it is. We are also going to be making Sunday premieres a thing. So 10 p.m., 10 to 11 p.m. Singapore time, that's GMT plus eight hours, uh, we will be doing live premieres. So the premiere chats will be this year every single Sunday. That's it. We're just going to be doing the premieres. I'm not going to be doing them randomly. If I upload otherwise, like in the middle of the week, we're just going to leave that. Premieres every Sunday night. I hope to see you there. We have so much fucking fun in those live chats and I can't wait to see you. And don't forget to follow me on TikTok at The Swiftologist because it's about to get popping over there. All right. Goodbye, Swifties. I will see you in the next one.